Good afternoon, and welcome to Teaching Truth, Putting Students First panel discussion. Before we get started, I want to say that for those of you who don't know, we are in a global pandemic still, and the technology that we are using is uh, we're working and making sure that it works as best we can. So if there's any issues, we will pause and we will take care of that because that's what we do. I'm Reverend David Miller. I am the senior minister at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax in Virginia. Today we have some amazing panelists who will introduce themselves in a moment. But first, I want to say a few words about why this congregation is sponsoring this event, along with the Emmaus United Church of Christ here in Vienna, Virginia, and Showing Up for Racial Justice Northern Virginia, with the incredible support uh, from the African American Policy Forum. Like many of us, I hadn't heard of critical race theory until relatively recently. This is because it has been used as a wedge by politicians talking about how it should not be taught in the schools, even though it is not taught in the schools. I have been to our local Fairfax County School Board meetings and witnessed hostility directed towards the school board around critical race theory and other political wedge issues like mask requirements and trans inclusive policies. In the past few months, there has been an effort to ban LGBTQ theme books in Fairfax. For now, the effort was defeated. But similar efforts to narrow and control the narrative in this country has been attempted elsewhere including attempts to ban books by Toni Morrison. Rampant fear-based disinformation has too much power. This week in the Virginia House of Delegates, new legislation was proposed that would restrict teachers from discussing the nation's and Virginia's true history among other almost unbelievable restrictions. This kind of politics has cost educators across the country their jobs, including some of our panel members today. We believe that students want truth. Students want to learn how they can contribute to a better world. Students want and need their own history and perspectives honored, including black history, Latinx history, indigenous history, women's history, LGBTQ history. All students need to access, need access to accurate and inclusive history to understand the complications of our national journey and to grow into adults who can make the world more loving, compassionate, and equitable. Hallmarks of the beloved community as envisioned by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. For Unitarian Universalists, beloved community is a prophetic vision and Martin Luther King is a prophetic voice. To honor Dr. King, we believe we are called to service and justice. Every year at UU Fairfax, we hold a weekend of service on MLK Weekend, which usually focuses on projects to support the local community. But it's also become abundantly clear that we need to speak out against the way Dr. King's words are misused. On the Fox News show, Life, Liberty, and Levine this past October, our new Virginia governor said this, quote, in the immortal words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we're called to judge one another based on the content of our character and not the color of our skin, Youngkin said. And that's why there's no place for critical race theory in our school system, system and why on day one, I'm going to ban it. Today in his first day in office, today in his first day in office, I have no reason to believe he won't follow through on that promise. I see numerous problems with this statement about banning critical race theory being taught in schools on his first day in office, because today, once again, Virginia doesn't teach critical race theory in schools. And I'm guessing Dr. King would never want his words to be used this way. So for all of these reasons and more, we are grateful to have this incredible panel. This panel is about teaching the true, challenging, and messy history of this country to our students in part because you it is the truth. It also speaks to our desire for our future generations to be better equipped 
to strive and maybe even succeed in overcoming fear and hate in order to build that long sought after beloved community of all souls. The panel today is an opportunity to dispel disinformation, clarify what critical race theory is and is not, and learn about issues in education both in Virginia and across the country. After the panel, I'll also close with a pledge about the work we plan to do here at UUCL, UUCF and an invitation to other congregations and interested people to do the same work. So with deep and abiding gratitude, I'd like to thank our UUCF Social Justice Coordinator, Andrew Batcher, for coming up with this idea, our Racial Justice Steering Committee for supporting it, our partners showing up for racial justice and Emmaus United Church of Christ, and all of our distinguished panel, and certainly the African American Policy Forum for all of their support, and our fabulous moderator, Tanashia Williams. Thank you so much, Reverend Dave. I don't know how I can follow that. I think this is your day job. So I, I thank you, thank you for that. And I wanna go ahead and get us started with some introductions, but not just any old regular introductions. Yes, I want you to hear from the panelists and get a sense of who they are, but I would also love panelists if you gave a little snippet of your personal intersection with critical race theory. So Penny Blue, why don't we start with you? Good afternoon. As noted in my bio, I authored and published a book in 2020, March of 2020, uh, prior to the George Floyd murder and the many uh, Black Lives Matter protests around the world. And it was titled, A Time to Protest, uh, Leadership Lessons Learned uh, from My Father Who Survived the Segregated South. I think this is important to mention because in that book, I, turned, I coined a phrase called um, blacklash, not backlash, but blacklash. So needless to say, I have experienced um, critical race theory and understood critical race theory for a long time. Now, the first time I ever heard of critical race theory was this past June when I was collecting signatures to qualify to be on the November 2021 ballot to run for school board for my third term or my third four year term. I approached this white couple and asked them for their signatures. And they said, well, do you believe in critical CRT? And I said, well, I've never heard of CRT. They said, well, critical race theory. So, I've never heard of critical race theory. So they informed me if I was going to be on the school board, then I needed to understand and know what critical race theory was. So from that point on, uh, our school board was bombarded with people from the community uh, using their three minutes to sing, pray, and criticize us teaching critical race theory in the school system. So that's a little bit, bit about my background and my introduction to critical race theory. I do think it's important also to mention that the school board that I was on, Franklin County, Franklin County is located in the southwestern part of Virginia in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains right outside of Roanoke, Virginia. And it's about a 70-30 split with regard to Republican Democratic voters. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that. Naomi, we're gonna to move to you. Hi, thank you. Um, and thank you for having me. My name's Naomi Jewell, and I am currently a critical race theory fellow at the African American Policy Forum. So working directly with these issues on a daily basis. I'm also a PhD student at Union Theological Seminary at Columbia, Columbia University. And I am focusing on both interreligious engagement and the intersection of race, religion, and law. In addition to the work that I do at AAPF, um, I'm a former practicing attorney, a DEI consultant, and a minister and founder of NIA Center, which is an interfaith and empowerment community. So I am very much looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you, Tanishia. Thank you. Let's move to Andrea. 
Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for, for having us. So I'm Andrea Kane. And my, my background is the last 30 years I've been in public education. Uh, currently, I am the practice professor at University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education. And as you know from my bio, I served as the superintendent in Queen Anne's County in Maryland for four years. You know, my intersection with critical race theory probably came, you know, over 10 years ago as I was doing my dissertation, doing my doctoral work. My dissertation is in uh, the achievement gap between African American males in middle school and their white counterparts. So I did a lot of research on critical race theory and socio political theory, all those things that have to do with culture and how culture impacts how students learn. Um, and how culture impacts how teachers teach. So I've, I've had an opportunity to do quite a bit of study and a lot of work in those areas. My work is overall public uh, K-12 education, but over the period of you know the last 30 years, I've done a lot of focusing on equity, equity work in suburb, large suburban districts, uh, small rural districts, and as well as urban districts. So I've had an opportunity to interface with lots of different families, communities, educators, students from various backgrounds, as well as being the first African-American female superintendent in Queen Anne's County. I have a lot of history and background on what critical race theory means, but I'm going to follow uh, Reverend Miller in saying there's no critical race theory being taught um, in, in schools that I know of. And, and I've had an opportunity to um, interface with many schools, not just in my own school districts. So uh, this is gonna be a great conversation, particularly to enlighten folks who, who, who may be on the borderline and think they know, but don't really know what critical race theory is and how it impacts uh, students and, and what all this rhetoric is, is about um, in, in society today. I'm just so grateful to be a part of this conversation. So thank you for having me. Thank you. We're so happy to have you here. Um, Reverend Bill. Thank you, Tanashia. I'm uh, Reverend Bill Sinkford, and I uh, serve the First Unitarian Church of Portland, Oregon. I've been here for about 11 years, but prior to that service, I was president of the Unitarian Universalist Association located in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And in that role, I was the first uh, African-American to serve a traditionally white religious denomination. So I am familiar with uh, issues of resistance. Um, the, um, the reality in Portland, Oregon, is that Portland is a very progressive community overall. And although conservative forces tried to force through regulations out, uh, outlawing critical race theory in the Portland public schools, they were turned back. But in all of the districts in the surrounding areas, which are tend to be much more rural, issues around critical race theory are quite live. So uh, I and my congregation, we have had an opportunity to, to raise our voice in uh, statewide areas uh, to try to bring some sanity to the conversation. Because like Virginia, critical race theory, theory is taught in no Oregon public schools. Um, I should also say that critical race theory functions as a kind of cipher for resistance to the major changes that are taking place in our society, changes that are leading, we hope, toward a vibrant, pluralistic, multicultural uh, democracy. And so I see it used as a cipher even in my congregation, which is quite progressive, and in other, other congregations, other religious spaces here in Oregon and around the nation. Uh, and I think that that use is unfortunate because it, it, it ramps up, amps up the, uh, the, uh, the emotional energy and makes it harder to have a, a reasoned conversation. I'm too, I'm looking forward to this conversation this afternoon. Yes, sir, and James, my friend. Hello, everybody. It's so good to be with you all and just this thanks, humble to be here. I've been in education for nearly two decades and with the second half of that time, served in school 
uh, administration and different administrative capacities. And most recently, I was the first African American principal at a particular high school in Texas and was caught up in the anti CRT movement that we've seen crash school boards and local communities across our country. And um, here's the thing. I firmly believe that all students, regardless of their race, zip code, whatever factor or bucket you want to throw them in, they should all have access to an excellent and equitable education. And I believe we, we need to celebrate diversity and create these inclusive spaces where people aren't just tolerated, but celebrated and, and heard and valued. And my unapologetic stance in that regard is it, it put me firmly in the crosshairs of this particular group um, that we know that it's, they don't really know what critical race theory is, but they wanna lump everything that has to do with progress, racial equity, inclusivity, diversity, um, you know, anything that goes along the lines of that particular language, they wanna lump that into it. But, you know, one of the things that, I'm finding as a positive to this is it's it's actually sparked conversation and it's putting us out there to really have the the uncomfortable the, that experience that discomfort and have the conversations that we need to have to create that beloved community that that Dr. King spoke of and I'm here for it I'm here for all of it. thanks for having me Thank you for being here. You're here for it. I'm here for it. We're here for it. And I will just echo the sentiments of um, all of our panelists and our, our facilitators. Thank you all so much for joining with us this afternoon. And let me just briefly introduce myself. My name is Tanishia Williams, and I have the honor of serving as a critical race theory researcher at the African American Policy Forum. And, and by way of answering this question, this is like my, um, when did you first fall in love with hip hop, but it's when did you first intersect with uh, critical race theory question. I, I will share that I first found critical race theory in the course of my doctoral studies. So I'm an educator and I've been, I don't wanna say the year cause I'm young out here. I'm not gonna tell you the year, but it's a lot of them, but I'm an educator and I have served as a teacher, a principal an executive director, um, an instructional superintendent. And I've worked in Newark, New York city, Virginia and Washington DC. And I, I've, I've made the choice to work with underserved populations throughout my entire career. And, and the whole time I kind of asked myself, well, why is it, why, why is there this blatantly identifiable line of achievement? So similar to what Andrea talked to us about, why is there this blatantly identifiable line of achievement? And why can we sort the two groups of kids where on one side of that line of achievement, they're, they're doing well and they have high scores. And on the other side of that line, they're not doing as well. Why, why can we look at those two groups and sort them by race and socioeconomic status? I had issues with that. I still have issues with that. And I think that has driven my doctoral studies. So in the course of obtaining a PhD, I'm not quite there yet, but pray for me, I'm gonna get there soon. But in the course of obtaining this PhD, you have to look for a theoretical framework. And I, I, I the day that I, I learned of critical race theory and I, I started to dig deep, it was as if someone turned a light on for me. I would say that I, through this framework, I was able to start to make meaning in, in the why, start to really look at the systems that exist and the laws that kind of govern school everyday processes. And, and I was like, oh, well, I can totally look at these outcomes being outcomes of black students, particularly in education. And I can trace it to the laws that exist, the systems that exist, the ways that we define achievement and what we use education for. So for me, um, my first interaction with critical race theory was I think my coming to understand more deeply um, our responsibility in public education. So I said a lot and I wanna go ahead and get us started because we have a panel of, of brilliant geniuses who are going to bestow unto us, uh, not only some of their stories, but we're really gonna engage in what's really going on in the legislation and in Virginia. So Naomi, I started talking about this theoretical framework and I, I, I know that we are gonna turn to you to not only define critical race theory for us, but to tell us what critical race theory is and isn't. So we've heard from the folks on our panel about when they first interacted with it, but take a moment and just break it down for us. What is it? What isn't it? And uh, lead us through that discourse. Yeah, that that is the the question of the day. And you know, I think it is ironic 
that Governor Yunkin and other Republicans have latched on to the term critical race theory as the target of their cultural war, because the whole effort is a case study in what critical race theory studies and explains, right? So uh, critical race theory was first developed in the 1970s and 80s by legal scholars, scholars like Derrick Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw and many others. And so Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who's also the executive director of the African American Policy Forum, uh, shout out to Dr. Crenshaw, shout out to AAPF. Uh, she's also a law professor at Columbia and UCLA. And she originally coined the terms critical race theory and intersectionality. And so intersectionality gets talked about. So forgive me, Tanishia, but I just want to take two seconds and talk to people about what that is as well. So intersectionality refers to the interconnected nature of social categorizations, things like race, class, gender, nationality, physical, mental ability. And so they uh, it's considered as they apply to both individuals and groups. And the crux of intersectionality is that overlapping identities can create compounded discrimination or disadvantage. For example, someone who, who's LGBTQ plus and, and also a woman is subject to gender and sexual orientation bias. Black women are subject to both sexism and racism. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about intersectionality. Now, critical race theory is an academic framework a legal academic framework, a lens, a legal lens for research that uh, uncovers both the overt and subtle ways racism is structurally embedded in laws, policies, and institutions that uphold and reproduce racial inequalities. So CRT reveals how systems and policies that appear to be race neutral can have disparate impacts that discriminate and marginalize. How that shows up is societal issues like Black Americans and other people of colors having higher mortality rates, victimization by police violence, mass incarceration, higher than average student loan debts, limited home ownership, lack of affordable housing, disproportionate death of Black women in childhood, and death from COVID. These are not simply unfortunate and unrelated phenomena. They are the results of generations of laws and policies that were intentionally designed to marginalize specific populations and create racial divides, which is exactly what these so-called anti-CRT laws are doing now. So what I'd like to do now is turn it over to Dr. Crenshaw herself. And we've got a great video here that I think sums it all up. Last summer, the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery catalyzed an unprecedented worldwide mobilization, activating tens of millions of Americans of all races to demand institutional accountability and reform. As these images spread across the world, the right scrambled for a way to snuff out this transformative energy. And they think they found it by orchestrating a repressive censorship campaign. In Arizona, Idaho, Texas, Georgia, we are seeing school boards attempting to rewrite curriculums, teachers getting fired for educating their students about racial disparities, and potentially an entire generation being fed lies about American history. Make no mistake, what we are seeing now is a calculated backlash to last year's summer of racial reckoning. The right is gonna try to convince you that we need to ban critical race theory, intersectionality, structural racism, implicit bias, diversity training, and the 1619 Project. But understand that this organized, well-funded, and coordinated campaign isn't an honest debate about these ideas. Most couldn't even define what these ideas are. And that's the point. They want to scare and silence our society back to colorblind submission where George Floyd and Black people's killability is just a natural, everyday feature of American life, unproblematic, unchangeable, and disconnected from the history of anti-Black racism. From the criminalization of abolitionist literature to the McCarthy-era witch hunts, we've seen the government respond to liberatory movements through the repression of anti-racist ideas time and time again. 
If you are concerned about these efforts to censor history, to muzzle anti-racist speech, to expand voter suppression and to criminalize protest, we urge you to join us in standing up for racial justice. We need to fight back like our lives depend on it because they do. That's right, our lives depend upon it. So Tana Shia, that's what it is and that's what it isn't. All right, well, thank you so much for that uh, definition and that beautiful opening and lead in. And I will also say thank you for figuring out a way to bring Kimberly Crenshaw into this conversation uh, because we will also bring Martin Luther King into this conversation. So let me start us off with our second segment. Um, and just to bury my lead, as I've just said it, we, we've chosen some MLK quotes and some MLK audio that you will hear throughout this panel as, as not only a way to bring those voices into the conversation, but to contextualize some of those sentiments in what we are experiencing today. So on August 31st, 1967, MLK delivered an address at the National Conference on New Politics. In this speech, he described three distinct evils of society. He described that first evil as racism, the second was poverty, and the third was war. So I want us to hear an excerpt from that speech so that we can contextualize our next segment. I wish that I could say that this is just a passing phase in the cycle of our nation's life. Certainly times of war, times of reaction throughout the society. But I suspect that we are now experiencing the coming to the surface of a triple-pronged sickness that has been lurking within our body politic from its very beginning. That is the sickness of racism, excessive materialism and militarism. Not only is this our nation's dilemma, it is the plague of Western civilization. As early as 1906, W.E.B. Du Bois prophesied that the problem of the 20th century will be the problem of the color line. Now as we stand two-thirds into this crucial period of history, we know full well that racism is still that hound of hell which dogs the tracks of our civilization. Ever since the birth of our nation, white America has had a schizophrenic personality on the question of race. She has been torn between cells a self in which she proudly professed the great principles of democracy and a self in which she madly practiced the antithesis of democracy. This tragic duality has produced a strange indecisiveness and ambivalence toward the Negro, causing America to take a step backward simultaneously with every step forward on the question of racial justice to be at once attracted to the Negro and repelled by him, to love and to hate him. There has never been a solid, unified, and determined thrust to make justice a reality for Afro-Americans. The step backward has a new name today. It is called the White Backlash. But the white backlash is nothing new. It is the surfacing of old prejudices, hostilities, and ambivalences that have always been there. It was caused neither, it was caused neither by the cry of black power, nor by the unfortunate re recent wave of riots in our cities. The white backlash of today is rooted in the same problem that has characterized America ever since the black man landed in chains on the shores of this nation. So 
at the end of that excerpt, King explains, quote, the white backlash of today is rooted in the same problem that has characterized America ever since the black man landed in chains on the shores of this nation. We have often characterized the attacks on CRT and the attacks on telling truth in schools as another manifestation of white supremacy and perversive racism pervasive racism. I will also say we, we are want to have this notion to say it is not taught in K-12 schools, but I do just want to make the iteration that we do ask children, analyze the social, emotional, and economic impact of World War I or World War II. Where we go deeper and, and where those lines of CRT cross is that we, we also want to analyze them by everyone who exists in the nation, not just by some. So I, I just wanna make that iteration as I pivot to our pedagogues and Andrea, James and Penny, these questions are really for you. Um, I, I would love for you to talk about how critical race theory has shown up in educational spaces. James, I'm gonna start with you. Please tell us what does teaching truth mean and how does the act of instructional integrity play out for teachers and school leaders? Yeah, thank you, Tanishia. So teaching truth for me, it, it is just that. It's teaching a accurate and inclusive history, you know, giving students an opportunity to engage, explore, question, and discuss complex problems and, and pieces of work. And so let me let me ask you this. Um, for so long in our country, whose experiences have been centered and who have been cast aside? And if I could get a show of hands, and I know I can't see everybody right now, but a show of hands, how many of us as adults have said in our adulthood, man, I sure wish I would have learned that in school as we learned about later on in life, the, the atrocities such as the Tulsa race massacre, right? So if I know if I could see a show of hands in the audience, I have no doubt that I'd see many hands raised and we have to recognize that this is a problem. We've been deprived of knowledge that could have helped us heal and helped us move forward. And school leaders and teachers across the country know what's being taught in schools. And here's what's absolutely fascinating about it. There's this outcry over what's being taught in schools across the country with particular attention paid to history as if students are really learning these hard truths that will bring this guilt and shame. But oddly enough, what they're crying for already exists in textbooks across the country, which are aligned to whatever state standards, right? So they already have the most basic whitewashed version of history being taught in schools. It's, it's just ironic to me that that is their, their, their outcry when they already have what they're saying that they want. For instance, in Texas, we have this a full seventh grade year dedicated to Texas history, but we, we don't veer into what the huge motive was for the Texas revolution. And that was, you got it, the desire to preserve the institution of slavery. And so, so much of uh, what the, the father of Texas, Stephen F. Austin, he, he spent years going back and forth with Mexico City bureaucracy over the necessi necessity of enslaved labor to the Texas economy. He went so far as to write, write in 1832 that nothing is, wanted mon uh, nothing is wanted but money and Negroes are necessary to make it. But that's not part of a history that we share with students, but it's imperative that we, we share that with young people and they have, because they have access to more and more information. Uh, and they're going to find out these truths at some point uh, then we'll have to answer those questions of why we never endeavored to teach these truths and what will be our answer. And my, my hope is that we, we don't have to answer that question, um, that we'll stand up for inst instructional integrity, you know, so teachers can do what they're called to do uh, and that all students can have access to an accurate, equitable, inclusive, and most excellent educational experience. So let me find out you're out here teaching today. I mean, we did say this was a teaching, 
But I want to thank you, Dr. Whitfield. You got the folks raising their hands. You got them giving you answers to questions. And I want to thank you for that. So I should I pivot now a bit to Penny? We would love to hear from you about what, what is happening in school board meetings. And in Virginia, it is quite the tale. But talk us through a little of your experience having served on a school board and, and tell us a bit about what we see manifest by way of critical race theory in um, school board meetings. Okay, first of all, I'll share with you guys today what the school board shared with those protesters that bombarded the school board meetings over the past number of months. And first of all, school boards do not make or create law. School boards follow the law. Secondly, we share with them that school boards don't determine the curriculum in K through 12. The K through 12 curriculum is determined at the state level. It is measured at the state level by standards of learning tests, which are statewide or are called SOLs. And so it measures whether students are learning what the state feels that they should. It measures whether teachers are teaching what the state believes that they should teach. And it measures the school system as to whether we are doing what it is we're supposed to do. And we provided this information to those protesters with regard to where it is determined what is taught in schools. And we also provided them with information how they could give feedback at the appropriate level to the appropriate people with regard to what was being taught in schools. But the bottom line is, as everyone on this call knows, CRT is a dog whistle. It really wasn't about uh, what is being taught in the school system, which is very important as to what is being taught in the school system, but it was about power. And the power in the state does not rest in the hundred and so school board districts, it rests at the state level with the governor and et cetera. So that is really about really what the CRT dog whistle was in regard to. It was about the state race. For instance, I said, I live in a county that's 70, 30 Republican uh, Democrat. I knew uh, at, at, after critical race theory came out that uh, became part of the dialogue that I was not going to win. I was not concerned about that. What I was concerned about was the state race, which is where the power is, which is where uh, things are going to uh, make the difference even going forward with regard to what is being taught in the school system. Thank you so much for that. I want to pivot now to Andrea. If you can provide a little context for us, we know that you are not only a superintendent in Maryland, but you now serve um, as a professor of practice at an Ivy League, no less. So talk us through like this, what, what we're seeing manifest in both K-12 and in higher education. And the fact that the threats, there's like, a, there's a permeable wall, like the threats are in both spaces. So talk us a little through that. Thank you for that. And I, I'm gonna agree um, with, with Penny and say that, um, first of all, the school boards definitely, in, in some states do not control the curriculum, but in some states they do. So, so for example, in Maryland, and I've worked in Maryland and Virginia, the school board is responsible for approving the local curriculum. And that's where school boards are getting this, uh, this power. Um, and that's where we're running into difficulties. And that's why parents are, are storming school board meetings because they know that in it, probably in their state, the school board can have some impact. So say for example, um, I was superintendent in Maryland and our local school board decided, I was in the process of diversifying our novels. Um, to support our English language arts curriculum. We wanted to be sure that students had some options with the books that they read, that teachers had some options, that they were not reading just novels with a uh, white male protagonist. They were reading novels that had diverse authors and with diverse themes, um, accepting and belonging uh, for among students that were different. 
So, and, and the school board decided that they didn't like a, one of the books and that book was Harbor Me. And honestly, anybody who knows anything about Harbor Me by Jacqueline Woodson knows that there's absolutely no harm in anything that is in that book that is designed for middle and high school kids. So they decided that they wanted to ban that, jump on the board bandwagon, uh, because there was a, a student in that book that had that was an, an immigrant. His family was immigrants, and there was some issue about immigration laws and that kind of thing. And so they just jumped on that. So, you know, the danger, not only at the pre-K uh, to 12 level, but also at the university level, is in giving people with this perceived power the the authority to reign over what we learn at, at both levels. I'm going to say at the pre-K 12 level and at the university level, we're talking about challenging our thinking. We're talking about, I mean, why do people go to college? People go to college so that they can expand their opportunities um, to, to have a better life you know, higher income, absolutely. But they know that the process to getting there is about thinking. They're going to be challenged to think critically. High school students, elementary, middle school students, teachers challenge them to think critically. That doesn't mean spoon feeding every little bit of information, but that means allowing them to grapple, right, with history, with what is actually happening in classrooms, whether you're in a third grade classroom or a doctoral class. Right. It's about challenging them to grapple with concepts that are complex and that are real. Right. So our history, regardless of who likes it, is real. It happened. How do we prevent these kinds of things from happening again? What are your thoughts? What are some ideas on things that could have, um, you know, had a different impact? Challenge the thinking and what we're what we're in the middle of are, you know, and let me just put it the way that it appears to Andrea Kane. we're in the middle of a season where we have white males who are fearful, white males with legislative power who are fearful that people of color are going to get together, and not just people of color, but allies of people of color are going to get together, actually mobilize like they are doing, right? And put an end to some of this foolishness. And, and that's the way I see it as absolute foolishness. It is hateful. It is, it, it is insulting to think that we cannot allow children to understand the history that we've had and to grapple with that, right? And to think about it critically and think about how it can not happen again. What we're experiencing is it happening again. We are in the middle of experiencing some white males who are going to try to control what everybody else thinks about a subject, what everybody else does about a subject. This is critical race theory. It is about power. It is about who has the power and how that power influences general society. So if we talk about whether we're talking about it in terms of public pre-K to 12 or at the university level, which heaven knows that would impact so many things. It would impact funding for research. Let's think about politicizing that, right? How many more studies do we get to, to do to show how power influences society, how culture influences society? That would probably get cut right? That cuts off a level of thinking. So those are the kinds of things that I, you know, really consider when I think about what is happening right now with critical race theory, whether it is at the pre-K to 12 or the university level. I think about it in terms of criticality of thinking, of how we can mobilize ourselves to do something about what we know wasn't right, it, there's nothing right about U.S. history, about white men stealing land from Native people, about them stealing Black Africans from one country, bringing them to another to make, to make force them to work the land that they get the benefit of. We can't have that happen. We can't have people saying, you can't learn to read. You can't think about this, or you can't think about that. You can't talk about how sexism, how racism impacts a, a, a great number of people. What kind of thing is that? You know, we should be beyond that kind of thinking. And that somebody is different from us 
it makes us American. Everybody's not the same here, but we've had different experiences and we just have to acknowledge that and allow people to think about what happened so that we can keep from pre uh, repeating those kinds of histories. So say it's the professor of practice at the University of Pennsylvania. Listen, friends, I just have, I feel, I, I feel compelled to take a moment to say that your panel is composed of uh, men and women of the cloth and teachers. So you're about to go to church and you're about to go to school all in one. So I want to keep us moving and I want to thank you all for that. Um, I, I was going to touch on how um, you talked about students not seeing themselves in the curriculum, not seeing themselves in education. And I know that we're going to loop back to it. So I just want to say thank you all my pedagogues for contextualizing for us what we are seeing in schools. And thank you for from raising our hands to getting us to feel it. Thank you for bringing us with you. I also want to just make quick note that um, Dr. Whitfield, they have taken you seriously. I see your hands in the chat, my friends. I see your hands and I would just like to say, as your questions arise, please don't hesitate to send your questions to truth at UUCF.org. We're not gonna be able to answer your questions right now, but whether you are watching this live or whether you screen this later, if a question arises, please send that question to truth at, oh, I've lost it, truth at UUCF.org and we will make sure, no, see, that's not right. Let me correct myself. Teaching hyphen truth at UUCF.org. So let me tell let me say that one more time from the top and get it all correct. Because you know I can model, I can model um correcting your yes it's sir. Teaching truth at UUCF.org. Teaching truth at UUCF.org. Thank you, Reverend Dave. Thank you, Tanishi. Your voice came through like a beacon of light. So what he said, friends. All right, teaching truth at UUCF.org. Okay, my friends. So let me keep us moving. Um, I want us to move into education as a moral responsibility. So King delivered a sermon at the at Detroit Second Baptist Church on February 28th, 1954. In this sermon, Rediscovering Lost Values, he urges people to retrace their steps and go back to retrieve those lost values that are important in making a better world. He reiterates that truth is anchored in morality and spiritual laws, both of which are God-centered processes. So let's first hear some of this sermon and then we'll get into a little more discourse. Man is a scientific genius, has been amazing. I think we have to look much deeper than that if we are to find the real cause of man's problems and the real cause of the world's ills today. we are to really find it, I think we will have to look in the hearts and souls of men. The trouble isn't so much that we don't know enough, but it is that we aren't good enough. The trouble isn't so much that our scientific genius lags behind, but our moral genius lags behind. The great problem facing modern man is that that the means by which we live have outdistanced the spiritual ends for which we live. And so we find ourselves caught in a messed up world. The problem is with man himself and man's soul. We haven't learned how to be just and honest and kind and true and loving. And that is the basis of our problem. The real problem is that through our scientific genius, we made of the world a neighborhood. But through our moral and spiritual genius, we failed to make of the brotherhood. And the great danger facing us today is not uh, so much the atomic bomb that was created by physical science. Not so much that atomic bomb that you can put in an airplane and drop on the heads of hundreds and thousands of people, as dangerous as that is. But the real danger confronting civilization today 
Is that atomic bomb which lies in the hearts and souls of men capable of exploding into the vilest of hate and into the most damaging selfishness? That's the atomic bomb that we've got to fear today. The problem is with a man within the heart and the soul of men. That is the real basis of our problem. All right, so Reverend Bill, I'm going to turn to you. King reminds us in this speech from 1954 of our moral responsibility. I would love it if you define that for us further. Give us an example. Tell us what it means. What is our moral responsibility? And should there be a moral code when it comes to educating our nation's youth? Thank you, Tanashia. It's always an honor to follow Dr. King, and it's always a challenge. Uh, Dr. King uh, talked about the need for, for, a, for a change of heart, for a conversion um, in the national consciousness and in, in all of our hearts. And what I know is that how we understand the truth and what we understand to be true has an impact on how open our hearts can be. So the Christian scriptures tell us that the truth can set us free, that the truth can be an, a way that we can liberate ourselves. And I do believe that that is true. That's what Dr. King was calling for, calling for a liberation of our spirits. But the reverse is also true, that, that lies and a refusal to know the truth can also keep us in chains. And that's what we're confronting today by those who are who are complaining about and trying to, to, to use critical race theory as a, a reason to close down access to the truth and the true story about our nation. Because, because this is actually a conversation about what story we tell about who we are as a people. And it has serious spiritual overtones because the effort to, to, to avoid the telling of the sins of the nation the effort to present America as an innocent country of good people who are going after good ends, that effort closes off the possibility of redemption. It closes off the possibility of our being able to confess that we were less than perfect, less than godly, less than the children of God that we are told that we all are. It closes off that process and and keeps us in chains. There's wisdom in the truth and reconciliation process that was first modeled in South Africa. There's wisdom there because it says that before you can move to reconciliation, before you can move towards salvation, to use traditional Christian language, you must know the truth and you must be able to tell the truth about yourself. I, I want to build uh, for a moment on, on, on Andrea's comments about harm, because, because a discussion of harm actually gets us in to the moral issues and gets us into the, into the ethical issues that are involved here, I think. And the truth is that, 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 that not telling the truth and that this effort to resist what is called critical race theory, which has been deconstructed for us, but that effort to not tell the truth, that the truth is that that harms everyone. It harms everyone. It harms black, indigenous, and person of color. It harms BIPOC folks, not just in reinforcing the, the, the differentials that have been mentioned, mentioned before, the differentials in, in educational attainment and income and uh, and the differential impact of COVID, and it, 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 it makes it difficult to deal with those, that is true. But for BIPOC folks, it also has a more internal impact. It says to us that we are actually invisible in the society. It invisibilizes our present presence. Or more specifically, it says that we are present but unimportant. 
It says that our lives do not matter, that black lives and brown lives and Asian, that they do not matter. So it clearly harms BIPOC folks, but it also harms the white community. And that I think is the important, one of the important dimensions that is often missed. It harms the white community because it allows the assumption of white innocence. And it also allows the white community to make the assumption that the lower income, the lower educational attainment, the higher incarceration rates among persons of color, even the virus, it allows them to make the assumption that those differences are the fault of people of color, rather than the result of centuries of being pushed down and held down and deprived of opportunity. It allows, it allows the belief that, that personal prejudice is the evil that we need to address, not the policies and the structures that push us down like knees on our necks and that grant others unearned benefits. The moral stance tries to eliminate undeserved harm and tries to work toward the common good. If the harm continues, we know that there are spiritual costs because in the end, the society will reap what it sows. I wanna make one other point here. It's a moral point, I think. And that is that, that uh, the argument against critical race theory is often, is often couched in terms of, 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 uh, of preventing discomfort for white children, preventing discomfort for white children. And I wanna say that, that morally and spiritually, comfort is not the goal of education. We wanna prepare our children to deal effectively with the truth of the world. And education at its best prepares our, our children to make good decisions as citizens. The role of the church, and I would argue the role of the school as well, was stated by Reverend William Sloan Coffin one time. He said the role of the church, and I would argue the role of the school, is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Sinkford. I'm gonna wait for that spotlight to come back here. Thank you so much. We're gonna take a five minute break. I wanna, I wanna mention again that your questions can be sent to teachingtruth.org and we'll try and get them to the panelists and then back to you. And also we'll be announcing that that is the address later for this initiative that we intend to take. And I'll speak to that at the close of the program today. Thanks again to the wonderful panelists. And we are going to now take a five minute break for people to take a stretch. And we'll be back promptly in five minutes.
All right, well, allow me to welcome us back from our break. And thank you, thank you. Hopefully you were able to enjoy some of those quotes. And uh, Precious Lord via Mahalia Jackson, I believe it is said to have been MLK's favorite. So I want us to come back from this break and really dig into Virginia and talk about exactly what's going on in Virginia, some of the legislation just this week, um, and really ground our conversation more concretely in what we're seeing manifest in our schools and our school boards and in the state houses. So on April 12th, 1963, Martin Luther King was arrested in Birmingham, Alabama for participating in a series of marches and sit downs against segregation. On this same day, a call for unity composed by eight local white clergymen in response to civil rights demonstrations taking place in the area was published. This open letter urged activists to leave matters of racial disparity to the courts rather than protest. Four days later, in the, margin, in the margins of the newspaper upon which a call for unity was printed, King composed a letter from Birmingham jail. We're gonna start this segment with an excerpt from that. At first glance, it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others. The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether the law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law of the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. So Naomi, my friend, I turn to you, our, our lawyer, our legal scholar. Um, I'd love for you to talk us through the status of legislation in Virginia on the heels of hearing MLKs that say that some laws are just and some are unjust. So explain for us the executive order, the jurisdiction of the school board, anti-CRT bills, and what is really going on in my home state of Virginia. Yes, we are definitely in the realm of unjust laws. So to answer your question, Tana, yeah, I'd like to start with some background. You got a little bit of this in the video, but I think it really bears repeating to understand these laws and where they come from. So the legal and public administrative phase of this backlash began with Donald Trump's response to the racial reckoning of 2020. And his response was Executive Order 13950. It banned federal agencies, contractors, and grant recipients from conducting DEI training, any DEI programs that address systemic racism and sexism. Now, although one of the first things that President Biden did when he became president was rescind 13950, the damage was done. What started with Donald Trump's executive order has become a campaign that is a full on war against racial and gender justice. And the result has been the enactment of similar laws across the country that censor teachers and erase American history from the classroom. We call these copycat laws. States have used legislative and administrative powers to enact these bans, and they essentially copy the language of now revoked 13950. 
as of today, 11 states have passed legislation banning what they're calling CRT in public schools or state and local governments. And only one state has been, uh, had these laws been vetoed. Seven other states have anti-CRT resolutions that were, were approved by their state board of education and one has an attorney general opinion. So what am I saying? That in some states, they are able to push this through the legislative bodies, the state Senate, the state house, and actually get this into legislation. In states where they're not able to do this because Democrats may have a majority, then they may go through the state board of education, which has the ability to create policies. And in states like Virginia, <laughs> where the governor can uh, appoint the leads of these uh, structural bodies, then they can kind of put them in a position to put these policies in place. So on January 12th, Virginia House Bill 781 was proposed. It is a copycat law. It essentially pulls from the language of Executive Order 13950. It would prohibit school boards and its employees from teaching what is vaguely named in all of these bills, divisive concepts. These divisive concepts include this, you know, making people feel bad about history. So it targets all discourse related to discrimination and identity, race, religion, ethnicity, gender, sexuality. So we should all be concerned about this. They also prohibit the hiring of DEI consultants, DEI training, or other similar initiatives. And in Virginia, parents who would be able to prove that their child has been subject to some divisive concept would then be given a voucher to send their student to another school. Yeah, the cat's out the bag. This is the Republican strategy to defund public education and privatize it. This is what this is really about in addition to really making people of color, indigenous people and people of non-binary uh, white uh, 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 identity feel bad about their backgrounds by demoralizing, marginalizing and keeping them from understanding their place in society. So what's important to note is that Youngkin on his own actually has limited power over local Virginia school boards. The General Assembly in Virginia uh, can legislate these policies, but those of you in Virginia may be aware that you currently have a Democratic majority. So there's a question whether House Bill 781, although it's been proposed, can actually pass the House and Senate in Virginia. Like I said, Youngkin knows this, which is why he brought in also this week this new superintendent, Jen, Jillian Below from Wyoming, right? And he's also able to appoint the, uh, the secretary of education. So he can put some appointees in to push through administrative policies. Now, this is where the school boards really become important because if using these agencies, some policy is pushed through Ultimately, in Virginia, the school boards will still have the power over any interpretation of any policies and ultimately of any enforcement. So that's why involvement and awareness with school boards is critical. So many of you may have seen in the media reports this week the ignorance with which this bill was written. Republican freshman, and I'm going to call his name, Ren Williams is the one who sponsored provision B3 of this bill. And this is so indicative of their lack of knowledge of American history. I've got to read it to you, because if I don't read it to you, you won't believe it. So B3 of this House provision 781 in Virginia says, the board shall incorporate into each relevant standard of learning and associated curriculum framework, a requirement that each student demonstrate the understanding of the first debate between Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. The first debate between Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Okay, I'm sure I don't need to say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. He is attempting to refer 
to the 1858 Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas debate, not the abolitionist slave Frederick Douglas. But folks, this is what happens when history lives into its name and becomes his version of the story, her version of the story, their version of the story, your version, my version. The African proverb is telling here, until the lion learns to speak or have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. This is what is at stake. Back to you, Tamshia. Damn, I don't know if I want to take the mic back. Um, and I, what I what I love about what you just did is you gave a concrete example, and then you corrected it. But I, I I do want to add to that, if if I may, for the educators who are listening, what is also interesting about that um that the B provision in this House bill is that we have an articulation of documents that should show up in a standards of learning assessment. Now for my educators who are out there, our job is to teach students skills. And we use lots of different content with which to do that. But what we are seeing in this part of this bill is an articulation of pieces of history that must be read. So essentially we are saying, make sure every student reads and knows all of these pieces because when they go to take the test, we gonna use these pieces in the test. So just to echo your point, Naomi, thank you for so concretely kind of spelling that out for us. And thank you for breaking down exactly what's going on in Virginia or in attempt of what's going on and what we are seeing in some of these proposed bills. So James and Andrea, I'm gonna turn it to you because I, I wanna hear some more of what's manifesting also in, in Texas and, and what you've experienced, Andrea, in Maryland, but we will first, here from MLK and one of his speeches particularly, which was given on April 14th, 1968, The Other America. So this is quite timely with what Naomi just said to us. In this speech, King juxtaposes two different Americas. One where, quote, America is overflowing with the milk of prosperity and the honey of opportunity, end quote. And another where the conditions are not are not as nice, where they're quite dire, actually. So let's hear a bit of this speech. But tragically and unfortunately, there is another America. And this other America has a daily ugliness about it that constantly transforms the buoyancy of hope into the fatigue of despair. In this America, millions of work-starved men walk the streets daily in search for jobs that do not exist. In this America, millions of people find themselves living in rat-infested, vermin-filled slums. In this America, people are poor by the millions, and they find themselves perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. In a sense, the greatest tragedy of this other America is what it does to little children. Little children in this other America are forced to grow up with clouds of inferiority forming every day in their little mental skies. And as we look at this other America, we see it as an arena of blasted hopes and shattered dreams. So the reality is that MLK gave this speech in a few different iterations. And one of the iterations for which sadly we don't have the audio, King said, quote, in this other America, thousands of young people are deprived of an opportunity to get an adequate education. 
Every year, thousands finish high school reading at a seventh, eighth, and sometimes ninth grade level, not because they're dumb, not because they don't have native intelligence, but because the schools are so inadequate, are so overcrowded, are so devoid of quality, so segregated, if you will, that the best in these minds can never come out. In this speech, we hear, even in 1968, of the disparities that exist within schools and how children of different races can be impacted. Fast forward to today. We've seen an onslaught of legislation that works to ensure silencing of narratives and a sterilization or sanitation, if you will, of history of what students learn. So Andrea and James, I turn to you to expand our lens. This is not just a thing that happened today or this week in Virginia. I've, I've had the pleasure of speaking with both of you and I have had the, the distinct or a distinct honor of kind of being immersed by your stories and your narrative. And I would love for you to share some of that with our audience um, by way of, of what is happening in Maryland, what is happening in Texas and, and how you've navigated those waters. And I'm happy to start with you, Andrea. Thank you. Um, and so, yeah, so Maryland has not passed legislation um, at this point. Maryland is largely a democratic state and because this definitely falls along political lines, um, it hasn't happened here yet. That is not to say that it couldn't happen because it certainly could. I mean, I left or, or finished my contract in a district that was um, very much um, opposed to critical race theory. And this was spearheaded by a particular parent in the community that just started screaming, you know, check your kids uh, backpacks and all that kind of foolishness for critical race theory <laughs> documents, which obviously they hadn't found any. And I guess because I was the African-American superintendent who later became known as the Black Lives Matter superintendent, which I'll wear that with pride, um, you know, because I was there, I guess it meant that I was doing something, um, you know, illicit to children. It was a ridiculous thought um, because we experienced a lot of success in, in the district where I left. Uh, we had the first African-American history course because prior to me being there, they did not have one. We, um, you know, had conversations with children in partnership with community um, partners to talk about race, students talking about race and Sunday supper committee, all of these, you know, different agencies that were centered on equity and, and really finding solutions to issues that plague the community, not just in Queen Anne's County, obviously it's, it's across the country, but specifically as it pertained to, to schooling in Queen Anne's County, it really was, um, you know, just some loud voices that were absolutely misinformed. And later I found it was in order to have a political platform. It was in order to have a, a reason to, to run for a political office um, and just to mobilize, you know, people who were who really were fearful and, and uninformed. But, you know, as it pertains to what's happening right now, that that's where we are. But I can tell you that it would, um, it would definitely, be more of what was already talked about copycat legislation because there has not been until now there has not been a cry for um, changing what students learned in school in terms of U.S. history. In fact in Maryland uh, just a couple of years ago we did the State Department of Education did change policy to say that they were going to be including um, materials of instruction and, and content in our history courses about LGBTQ and their um, contributions to US history because that's missing. And so to come back now and to create legislation that says you can have conversations about that would definitely be contradicting where we were a couple of years before this, which also was a couple of years before George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, Maude Aubrey. And so, you know, it would just show a jumping on the bandwagon type of a mentality if something like that was actually passed in Maryland, because the truth is the truth. And, and whether it doesn't matter what grade you're in, or you're in, it doesn't matter what ethnicity or race you, you hail from, the history is what it was. And when children ask, and they do ask, what happened, where were the black people or where were the Chinese people or you know, what was happening with women at this time and what are teachers left to say to them? You know, they're fearful, will they be fearful to respond to those kinds of natural questions for fear of losing their job? Because some legislators said, oop, don't talk about that um, because white children feel shameful. Who was concerned? 
when children were learning about slavery and some and nobody addressed how black children felt about that and i noticed in um in the questions there was a comment about you know how people are are feeling and their inferiority that sometimes people of color feel when you know certain certain ways of our society and our norms and our culture as americans um says that we are inferior, right? Points to that. Does anybody think about how that makes children of color feel? Nobody was concerned, no legislator was concerned about that until a white child or a parent of a white child said that white children are feeling shameful. And what we need to be doing is we need to be educating. We need to be educating so that they understand this is the history. It doesn't mean that you need to feel shameful. And by the way, child of color, it doesn't mean that you need to feel inferior, right? We need to be having these conversations so that we can stop this, so that we can stop this oppression. I know I've taken up more time than I'm supposed to, um, so I'll stop it at that um, and I'll just leave it there. Thank you, ma'am. James. Dr. Kane, that's gonna to be tough to follow up. You know, so much of what I have to say is in, in direct alignment to that. You know, we hear all the time here in Texas, it's copycat legislation like you see all over the country. You know, we don't want to present anything that would create guilt or, or shame in students or to make some feel like they're or, or oppressed or, or, or an oppressor. But here's here's the thing, like they're these people are definitely not talking to kids because the kids, the kids are good. The kids are ready to, to have these conversations. Believe me, I've spent time with them for the last two decades. Kids are good. It's, it's a certain segment of adults who are using those terms to try to fire up a base. Because if you want to get at people, if you really want to get at parents and families, what's the natural thing to do? Well, you tell them somebody's doing something detrimental to their kids, right? And get them all fired up. So the kids are ready. But as far as my personal experience here in Texas, you know, my heart's desire, uh, if you heard, heard previously in my introduction, is for every kid to have access to an equitable, excellent education, no matter where they come from, right? No matter the circumstances, they all get to be celebrated for their unique genius in this space. And, um, you know, one of the things I did when I became principal at the, the, the last high school I was at, um, it was during, in the wake of the George Floyd murder. And, you know, I saw all these people around me sending out these statements of support. And I saw companies changing their logos and, you know, black squares all over social media. And I was inspired one day to send out a message to our community because I was leaving one middle school. They didn't have a principal left at, the, at that time. I was coming into a high school. And so I sent it out to both communities and, and just said, hey, Essentially, I'm inspired by what I see around me. I'm hopeful, you know, in my 42 years, almost at that time, like I've never seen people come together and just unapologi unapologetically say Black Lives Matter in, in such a unified way. And I just, you know, sent out that letter of support. Well, that was one of those things that this group of people wanted to point to when it came time to attack me, a letter of saying that systemic racism is real, but how hopeful I was for the future that, that we could come together and, and move past these things. And one of the things we did is we created a diversity advisory council. It was made up of students, staff, community members, and it was led by students. And we didn't wanna just have a council in name because we have a lot of that. There's a lot of stuff that's there in name. We really wanted to be about action. You know, We did things like cre intentionally creating events surrounding the various uh, history months. We did an MLK Day of Service. It was a day on, not a day off. It was a huge, awesome event. We had a Holocaust Remembrance Vigil led by one of our Jewish students, uh, where students read the names of, of those who were exterminated by the Nazi regime. And these things did a great job of building community in some powerful ways that, that we hadn't seen. Cross sections of students were coming together in ways that they hadn't before. But you know, doing those things and having that stance that landed us in the crosshairs of those that, you know, will blatantly tell you that like, essentially they're hateful, intolerant, anti-equity. They think systemic racism is some kind of conspiracy. They don't want to hear about diversity. Uh, they don't want to talk about the disparities uh, in things such as GT programming and 
discipline rates, uh, test scores. They they don't want they don't realize that what they're providing society right now is a real time case study in critical race theory. Um, but I was unwilling to compromise on those things, and uh, because we know that there are real systemic issues that create barriers to, to students being ready for the next phase of their life, whether that's college, career, or military. And I, I'll never compromise on that because every kid deserves access to these opportunities that they've been systemically left out of. And sadly, that group of people uh, created a situation that, you know, that happened, but I'm hopeful because, you know, there's an overwhelming amount of support you know, I've seen in staff and families and people all around the world that are just in this time, even though it's challenging, coming together and finding their voices through, you know, this this issue. So it's especially the students, I want to give a shout out to the students. You've seen it. I saw it on my campus. You've seen it around the country. Um, students are using their voices and they're demanding to be heard. You know, there's a lot of talk about student voice, but um, man, students are, they're, they're stepping up and making sure their voices are heard. They blow me away. And I know a lot of people say kids these days in a tone that's more like, oh, what are, what, what are we going to do? Like we're doomed. But no, I'm, I'm really encouraged by what I see by our youth. If they are the ones leading us into the future, uh, the future is bright. But we have to, as the adults in their lives, we have to stand up and be, you know, stand on our morals um, and, and be unapologetic in that. So my friends, I wanna thank you for that. And I, I wanna pivot our conversation to a bit because I think that you gave us a beautiful precursor to what is about to be our, our one and only cross talk. But I wanna start that with an MLK excerpt from a 1965 appearance on Meet the Press. Uh, there can be no gainsaying of the fact that many of the state courts actually misuse and abuse the judicial process. And I would make a distinction here between a decision that comes from a state court that is committed to preserving segregation and a federal court that is committed to uh, bringing the basic and underlying truths of the Constitution into being. One distinguished jurist had said, has said, uh, Justice too long delayed is justice denied. And we have seen courts that have delayed justice and in the process denied justice. So I would make uh, the, a distinction here, but I think the, the situation is uh, one that has to be taken under consideration. So I think uh, we alluded to this earlier. I think, Naono, you actually brought out this point that earlier this week, uh, we did hear from Yonkin's camp on who he has tapped to lead uh, education in Virginia. And I just want to pull out that on January 13th, Yonkin, I'm sorry, the Richmond Times Dispatch published a piece that had a pull quote from Yonkin, where he said that he intends to, quote, restore excellence in education. He furthered, under my direction, the folks that he, he's hired will get to work on ensuring our schools remain safely open, ban critical race theory and political agendas from our classrooms and rebuild our crumbling schools. So I want to open us up to a crosstalk. And friends, we got to be succinct here because we are we are running at the, at the end of our day. But I want to open us up to a crosstalk. And I really want to look at or dig into how a theoretical framework has become so politically polarized. And so my question is, is, is this polarization exacerbated by this show of uh, political peacocking through which Yangen has made this decree of, of, of weaponizing this executive order? Did any of those word, words make sense? I just want to know how we got here and, and, and what your thoughts are about it. And this is a crosstalk, my friend. So pretend that we're sitting at the kitchen table. If you don't mind, I'd like to start that, Tanisha. And because um, I want to expand on what I mean meant by power of the school board versus the state, which is absolutely where we are and what we're talking about. Uh, the school board might be able to ban a book, but regardless, um, the school boards have to ensure that children can pass statewide tests. So therefore, what is taught in the school system is, as Naomi mentioned, is provided by at a state level. 
And when you go, and we mentioned earlier, we're in the midst of repeating history because we are. If you look back after the Brown versus Board of Education, that is when, right after that, is when the largest parent organizations got involved in the school system in Virginia and possibly, you know, across the United States. And in Virginia, it was led by what we call the bird machine. And they actually uh, shut down schools in the state of Virginia. They shut down schools in Charlottesville. They shut down schools in Norfolk and et cetera. And it wasn't until at the federal level that it was considered unlawful for them to do so that they had to open those schools back up. But then locally in Prince Edward County, the Board of Supervisors shut down the schools in that county for four years. So African-American children in that county weren't allowed to go, weren't able to go to school in that county for four years. Their parents had to send them outside of the county in order for them to get educated. So we are in the midst of repeating that now. And, and it is um, very much so political, which is why the political base has now gotten all these parents in an uproar coming to the school board uh, saying certain things. But the bottom line, the result is a statewide election where the governor, quote unquote, and possible legislation can put rules and laws in place. Because if laws are put in place with regard to certain things that you can teach and not teach in the school system, all the great programs that uh, you mentioned, James, will be against the law for schools to do. And sitting on the school board, we can have debates, or we have had debates, but where we win is, or where we lose, is when it is against the law or a part of the law. And so you had Governor Northam, who in, in, over the past several years Penny, started the app. Penny, before you give me a little more of the history lesson, which I do appreciate, I think we yeah. might have to give this to the people in a leave behind or a beautiful PowerPoint. I wanna make sure, because we're running a little short on time, I wanna make sure that I hear from others. So we heard from Penny, okay. that this is about to manifest in these laws. Other thoughts that you all have panelists. And thank you so much for that, Penny. You're quite welcome. Well, since laws was mentioned, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in here quickly. Uh, from my point of view, the pol politicization of CRT is part of an ongoing effort by a minority to prevent a truly multiracial democracy. The census show that racial and ethnic makeup of the United States is going to change. And so those who are seeking to keep power and opportunity in the hands of a few recognize that if they control the policies and practices of the three branches of the federal government, the state government, and the education system, then it doesn't matter what the masses think, want, or feel. That's why I chose this background, right? Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. The alarm has been sounded and it is blaring. So we either rise together as a community now or give democracy over to authoritarianism and oppression. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just add to that, like what we're dealing with here, we just need to call it what it is. This is an attack, all out assault on public education. Now they've done it in a number of ways over years. Usually it's, it's, it was during, it was over taxes, right? They would, they would come and talk to you about you paying too much in your taxes. Um, they haven't quite fully let that go, but they have found something in this anti-CRT movement, as I say, because they're hitting home, they're hitting people like, oh, somebody's trying to do something to your kids. So this has always been about public dollars that are going to support public schools, and we just need to call that what it is um, and, and be ready to stand up because only in a public school is every student, regardless of where they come from, regardless of their sexual orientation, regardless of their religion, whatever, you name it, they're accepted and welcomed in that space. The schools that these people would want are very exclusive in nature and definitely not for all kids. And so what we're in a battle for all kids to have access because if they strip those dollars, if they start stripping dollars that per pupil funding, 
um, we will only see further deterioration, especially in places that need this money the most. And so they know it's not CRT. They put the blueprint out there and they, Rufalo said it. He said, we know it's not this, it's, but we're just gonna try, don't believe the hype, stand up and fight for your public schools. We have to do it. I'll jump in here. I think that um, I value organizing greatly and organizing is clearly necessary now, but, but we are all being invited uh, to stand up and, and join in a fight in public. And it therefore becomes not about changing minds. It is easy for us to forget, as was just said, that, that the kids are ready for this. But more importantly, that huge majorities of the American people, both people of color and white people, are speaking from our point of view. We, our voices represent the majority by far. And so we don't need to get down in the trenches with, with some of the, those, the opponents. We can actually, we have the luxury because we are on the side of history of speaking with a voice of love, which actually allows the possibility for some of these folks, not today, because not everybody's gonna go with us today, but someday these folks are gonna to wanna to come along with us and join in the, in the future that is brighter and more optimistic. It's about how we show up, just to remember that we are speaking for the majority. I, you know, the comments that have been made to this point are just so on point. I just wanna put up a drop the mic meme um, because they, it, it has been so true. I think that because the important thing is that we are in the majority. So whether we're talking about people of color and our allies or, or just think of, around the concept of what's right for children and the concept of equity, we definitely are in the majority. Because I think that regardless of the side of, uh, you know, you take on this, people want what they believe is best for their children. I, 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 want, I want to believe that. And I, I'd also like to think that, you know, 10 years from now, we'll look back on this and, and think, oh my gosh, how could anybody have ever thought that what that, you know, banning critical race theory or not addressing the truth about our history was wrong? How can anybody ever think that? And why did I not, you know, uh, do whatever I could have done to, to support teaching the truth? Until this time, the truth always represented something that we, we wanted for our children. We wanted to talk about what was true. We wanted to be about the truth until now. So my hope is that, you know, in several years from now, we'll look back on that and say, that was one of the most ridiculous things in our history. We are not going back there again. We shouldn't have even had to fight that fight, but it was what it was, and now we're better for it. I would like to think that. But until such time, I think that it is incumbent upon us to mobilize ourselves, to get behind our legislators, to, to support our students, to listen, thank you, um, Dr. Whitfield, to our students and amplify their voices because what they wanna talk about, what they wanna learn about has got to be highlighted. That has, and, and they want the truth. They don't want anybody lying to them and keeping things from them. They want the truth. So I, I hope that we're able to take that away and say, let's amplify student voices. Let's share the truth and let's think about what we need to do, all of us, to make this place, this world that we live in better. So that, that's, that's what my hope would be. Tanisha, I would like to add something here, if you don't mind. I agree. Um, we probably we are in the majority, but we're in a very right now a slight majority. But what we also have to remember is this: America believes in democracy as long as certain people are in power. When they become afraid that they are no longer in power, then that is when they do not act in a democratic way. For instance, the insurrection at the Capitol is because of the browning of America. When we talk about the 15th Amendment, after the 15th Amendment was passed, that's when we had a lot of massacres with regard to destroying towns. I mean, one of the most uh, famous massacres, of course, was in um, 
Wilmington, North Carolina, where you had black politicians in power and et cetera. And mobs went in and took those people out of power, ran them out. And it was because North and South Carolina, it was majority African-American. So yes, we might be in the majority, but it is about the power at the federal level and at the state level. And that is who runs the educational system. And so we have to keep that in mind. I want to thank you all for the gems that you have dropped, for the knowledge that you have bestowed. I'm going to invite you to put together some resources of where folks can go next, what folks can do um, from the vantage point of a man of the cloth, from the vantage point of an education pedagogue, from the vantage point of an attorney, so that we can share those after this conversation. And I want to pivot us then to, to our, our closing um, our one, two, three, I guess our seventh participant in, in this panel, whose quotes we've made use of. And I'll start by saying on October 26, 1967, a little less than six months before Dr. King was assassinated, he spoke candidly to a group of teenagers at Barrett Junior High School in Philadelphia. He offered three critical points to add to our life's blueprint. So in the spirit of me gathering from you all some takeaways, some gems, some things that folks can do next that we can share out, I want us to listen to these gems that Dr. King shared with these students, because I think that they are just as applicable, one, to adults as they are to junior high school students. And I think they are just as applicable today as they were then. The first, and just to give you an overview, because this is about an eight minute video. So just to give you an overview, um, King promotes a deep belief in your own dignity, your worth, and your somebodiness. Um, the basic principle of excellence in all of our fields of endeavor. And lastly, a commitment to the eternal principles of beauty, love, and justice. So there, there are no more fitting sentiments than those that can be expressed or those that were expressed by Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And I would love us to hear those sentiments now. I want to ask you a question, and that is, what is in your life's blueprint? This is the most important and crucial period of your lives for what you do now and what you decide now at this age may well determine which way your life shall go. And whenever a building is constructed, you usually have an architect who draws a blueprint. And that blueprint serves as the pattern, as the guide, as the model for those who are to build the building. And a building is not well erected without a good, sound, and solid blueprint. And I want to suggest some of the things that should be in your life's blueprint. Number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your own worth, and your own somebodiness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you are nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth and always feel that your life has ultimate significance. Secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have as a basic principle the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. 
you're going to be deciding as the days and the years unfold what you will do in life, what your life's work will be. And once you discover what it will be, set out to do it and to do it well. And I say to you, my young friends, that doors are opening to each of you. Doors of opportunity are opening to each of you that were not open to your mothers and to your fathers. And the great challenge facing you is to be ready to enter these doors as they open. And so I would urge you to study hard, to burn the midnight oil. I would say to you, don't drop out of school. And I understand all of the sociological reasons why we often drop out of school. But I urge you, in spite of your economic plight, in spite of the situation that you are forced to live so often with intolerable conditions, stay in school. And when you discover what you're going to be in life, set out to do it as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. Set out to do a good job and do that job so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. If you can't be a pine on the top of the hill, be a scrub in the valley. But be the best little scrub on the side of the rill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. Finally, in your life's blueprint, must be a commitment to the eternal principles of beauty, love, and justice. Don't allow anybody to pull you so low as to make you hate them. Don't allow anybody to cause you to lose your self-respect to the point that you do not struggle for justice. However young you are, you have a responsibility to seek to make your nation a better nation in which to live. You have a responsibility to seek to make life better for everybody. And so you must be involved in the struggle for freedom and justice. Now in this struggle for freedom and justice, there are many constructive things that we all can do and that we all must do. And so our slogan must not be Burn, baby, burn. It must be build, baby, build. Organize, baby, organize. Yes, our slogan must be learn, baby, learn, so that we can earn, baby, earn. And with a powerful commitment, I believe that we can transform dark yesterdays of injustice into bright tomorrows of justice and humanity. Let us keep going toward the goal of selfhood, toward the realization of the dream of brotherhood, and toward the realization of the dream of understanding goodwill. Let nobody stop us. But we must keep moving. We must keep going. If you can't fly, run. 
If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl, but by all means, keep moving. Last summer, the And Dave, I'm actually going to turn it over to you. I, I will take this opportunity to, opportunity to thank our panelists. Thank you all so much for the gems that you have bestowed. Again, we promise to forward any sentiments that you have by way of recommendation to our audience members, both in the Zoom and on the streaming, and we'll make it available at the UUCF. I'm just making up things website for folks to archive, but Merwin, Dave, I'm now going to turn it over to you for our closing. Well, thank you so much, Tana Shia. What an amazing panel. Here's what we're going to do for all of those of you who are out there on the web. Just pretend we're together and let's give them an incredible round of applause. What a wonderful job. Thank you all so very much, panel, and specifically our fabulous moderator. Beauty, love, and justice. Uh, the mission here at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax is to transform ourselves, each other, and the world through acts of love and justice. And that's what we're gonna try and do. Um, I wanna thank again the Emmaus uh, uh, United Church of Christ, uh, Surge in Northern Virginia, and the African American Policy Forum. And I also wanna especially thank our staff here at UUCF who's worked hard on this event uh, to help make it possible. Uh, teaching our children really does take a village Parents, teachers, administrators, community members, we all have a role to play. At UUCF, as part of our religious exploration program, five years ago, we piloted an inclusive Virginia history curriculum for our religious program here at UUCF. Today, we are pledging to further develop this curriculum over the next year and to offer it for free to all those in nonprofit and faith communities who wish to join us in this pledge to teach the true inclusive history of this state. We do this regardless of what happens in the legislature or what Youngkin has done today, and I understand he actually did sign his executive order. We pledge to teach truth and work towards the beloved community envisioned by Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. So if your faith community or community organization would like to join us in this pledge, please send an email to the email that we've been talking about all day, teachingtruth at uucf.org, teachingtruth at uucf.org, so we can stay in contact and follow up. We also will be posting this um, event again online. And for those of you who registered, we have your email addresses. We'll be sending you more information about how you can find that out. We will continue to advocate at the Fairfax County School Board and in the Virginia Legislature in support of inclusive schools, accurate history, and putting students first. I, and I hope most of us here today, believe that it is a moral responsibility to support upcoming generations and counter harmful disinformation. For everyone who registered for this event and those of you watching on our web stream, uh, but for everyone who uh, registered for this event, you will get a follow-up today, including resources from today's panelists, which I believe Tanashia also said. And once again, I'd like to express my deep gratitude to our panel, to our fabulous moderator, and to all of you for being here today. It will take all of us to do this work it is the work that we called to do in this generation. This is the beginning of which I promise will be good and vital work to come. Amen, and may that be so. Thank you all for being here today.